Uh, we're moving on now to talk about uh, clinical tolerance induction in kidney transplantation. Allograft rejection is a major barrier to transplantation, uh, with the possibility of one day being able to completely eliminate the need for chronic immunosuppression in kidney transplant recipients being successfully explored in several pilot studies in the U.S., for our final session today, we welcome back Dr. Dixon Kaufman, along with Dr. Payman Hemanti, to discuss current research and some of the early results in clinical tolerance induction in kidney transplantation. Dr. Hemanti is a professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He is the director of the Clinical Hematopoietic Cell Processing Laboratory and, in that capacity, oversees all the peripheral blood stem cell collections. Dr. Hamati runs an active basic research laboratory with the goal of developing methods for ex vivo generation and expansion of hematopoietic stem cells. His clinical research interest is in the use of novel mobilization agents for collection of peripheral blood stem cells. Please welcome first Dr. Payman Hamati. Good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. So, uh, in the next hour or so, Dr. Kaufman and I, we're going to talk about how can we tolerate uh, recipients of uh, organs, specifically uh, kidney transplantation to the organ. Tolerance, uh, tolerance essentially means that the recipient tolerate the transplanted organ and, and not reject it. And are there ways that we can, we can induce that? Uh, there are spontaneous tolerance, uh, tolerant paper, uh, patients. There are patients who we induce tolerance with with uh, drugs, and there are patients that we try to induce tolerance with uh, bone marrow transplantation, and that will be uh, the topic of, uh, of this talk. So uh, the first half of talk, I'm going to talk about what is bone marrow transplantation, also known as hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and really I consider that to be the mirror image of uh, organ transplantation. Uh, this is my comf not comf disclosure that I just uh, co-founded a company, Cellular Logistics, about a few months ago. It's all on the paper, really. Okay, so what is hematopoietic stem cell transplantation? I'd like to start with this, uh, this slide uh, that shows the history of the bone marrow transplantation. And really, the origin of bone marrow transplantation goes back to uh, World War II and atomic bomb that were dropped on Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki because a side effect of the atomic uh, radiation was bone marrow failure. So many of those patients, their bone marrow stopped working and they bled to death or they had infections or uh, they became anemic and died. So there was a lot of interest in developing some way of protecting uh, soldiers and civilians from the potential uh, effect of the uh, atomic bombs. And that was really started the field of bone marrow transplantation because it was shown that in, in mice, if you irradiate the mice, they will die, but if you give them the bone marrow after irradiation, they will survive. So, but it took about uh, more than 30 years of research before it started taking off, even more, 40 years. So for 40 years, it was just done uh, based on very s small scale clinical trials and the results were not that successful, but over the years it, it became more successful to the point that for now it, it is estimated that we do about 50 to 60,000 transplant all over, bone marrow transplant all over the world. And it, it is believed that there are about a million survivors of bone marrow transplantation that is being done for different diseases. And I just want to say that there are, two, uh, there are two type of transplant. One is autologous that we use the patient's own bone marrow, and the other one is allogenic that we use a donor bone marrow uh, for transplantation. I also like to say that there are a lot, uh, we, are, we are, I think bone marrow transplantation is really uh, the mirror image of solid organ transplantation. But interestingly, the Nobel Prize in 1990 uh, was shared between Dr. Joseph Murray, who was the first who did uh, kidney transplant, and E. Donald Thomas, who was the first who did successful bone marrow transplantation. So it's just saying that uh, we get along, and, and there are a lot of things that are common between us and solid organ transplanters. Uh, 
So just a quick overview of the differences between solid organ transplantation and bone marrow transplantation. So in solid organ transplantation, you all know that we, we put an, a kidney from the donor inside the recipient. And in this case, the recipient immune cells are the cells that are trying to reject the organ transplanted organ like kidney. So these immune cells are from recipient, they are going after the, uh, the donor organ. In bone marrow transplantation, it's opposite. We put new immune cells from the donor into the recipient. And in this case, these are the donor cells, immune cells of the donor that are going after the recipient. So it's vice uh, opposite of this, which recipient cells are rejecting the donor cells. Here, the donor cells are trying to reject the, uh, the recipient cells. And this is what we call graft versus host disease versus rejection. You can also call it host versus graft. So that's the reason I'm saying bone marrow transplantation and solid organ transplantation is a uh, mirror image of each other. So as you all know, in solid organ transplantation, broad groups really matter. It's a very important factor. In bone marrow transplantation at all, we don't care. We can transplant from any, any blood group to any blood group. And the fact is that usually after about three to six months, the, the blood group of the patient will change to the donor blood group. So if we transplant, for example, an A group to an O group, after six months, the patient is now A group. The, the, the blood group of the uh, donor, the recipient will become the blood group. I mean, the blood group of the donor will become the blood group of the recipient. Uh, in solid organ transplantation, HLA is important, but not as much as the bone marrow transplantation. The biggest factor in bone marrow transplantation is really HLA typing. We, we need to have as much as possible HLA typing between the donor and recipient. And if we don't have a good match, then we will, we will have graft versus host disease as a complication. And I have to say, graft versus host disease can kill 25% of the patients if not controlled. So in solid organ transplantation, we have graft rejection. In bone marrow transplantation, we have graft versus host disease. So uh, what is bone marrow? Uh, bone marrow is uh, an organ inside uh, the long bones of uh, human body this is the way it looks under microscope. And the job of the bone marrow is to make all type of blood cells and immune cells, T cells, B cells, NK cells, platelets, red blood cells. And every day it is estimated that about hundreds of billions of blood cells are produced by this organ that resides inside the bone marrow. So this is a microscopic view of that, this is a, a view of the blood cells, and these cells are all made in the bone marrow and then travel to blood. So this is the bone marrow. And what is a bone marrow transplantation? Bone marrow transplantation is a procedure that we have a recipient, and like a kidney transplant, we have to prepare the recipient so the recipient doesn't reject the transplanted organ, which is here is bone marrow. And usually what we used to do that was using radiation, using chemotherapy for sometimes up to a week and sometimes 10 days prior to giving the bone marrow. And then the day that we call day zero, we go and give the, uh, the bone, new bone marrow from the donor. And as I said, there are two types of transplant. One is autologous and the other one is allogeneic. And in the case of allogeneic, because the donor is somebody else, it's not the patient, in the case of autologous, there is no risk for rejection or graft versus host disease because we are giving back the donor cells. But in the case of allogeneic, we have then to give medicines like what we do with solid organ transplantation, like tacrolimus, uh, to prevent graft versus host disease. And then we have the same problems like sol solid organ transplant patients because we have to take care of infections, viral infections, bacterial infections, fungal infections. But in bone marrow transplantation, in contrast to the solid organ transplant, usually we try to taper off the immunosuppression. Around the three months we start tapering, and by, by, by usually six months, patients are off immunosuppression. Because now the patient's bone marrow is full of the donor cells, and they have a new immune system, and we want the immune system to work. So at that time, we try to stop immunosuppression, but the only group of patients that are still will be on immunosuppression at that time are the people who have developed graft versus host disease because if somebody 
somebody's immune system is active and trying to destroy the recipient tissues, we have to suppress that and then we will continue using the immunosuppression. So again, these are some of the major differences between bone marrow transplantation and a solid organ transplant. Uh, as I said, the number of bone marrow transplants just go, uh, keep going up. Uh, these are the number of autologous transplants. These are the number of allogenic transplants. And uh, again, around 60,000 uh, bone marrow transplant is being done worldwide. So what are we using bone marrow transplantation for? As of now, the major indication for bone marrow transplantation is blood cancers, hematologic malignancies. Uh, like leukemias, lymphomas, multiple myeloma. And the reason we are doing that is that because there is no other treatment available for those type of diseases. There are diseases that drugs do not work most of the time. So we have to use transplantation. So that's what we do. It can be autologous or allogeneic. There are immunodeficiency diseases. There are kids born with uh, lack of immune system. And as I said, the bone marrow is making all human immune system uh, cells. So that's another major indication for allogenic transplant. We have to replace the bone marrow of the patient who doesn't make any type of immune cells with a normal allogenic uh, uh, bone marrow to, uh, have to develop a new bone marrow, functioning bone marrow. There are diseases like sickle cell disease that uh, your red blood cells are abnormal and a way to cure, the only way to cure that is really replacing the bone marrow cells with the new bone marrow, and that's again allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. A very promising, but it's still um, sort of experimental, uh, but it's uh, progressing rapidly, is use of bone marrow transplantation from the, uh, the donor of the organ to, uh, to not only replace the, 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 the organ, but replace also the bone marrow of the recipient. And if we can do that, then the, the bone marrow and immune cells of the recipients are going to be at the, the same type as the organ cells. So they will not reject each other. They will not fight each other. And that is what we call combined allogenic bone marrow and solid organ transplantation. And that's what Dr. Kaufman is going to talk about. And then some autoimmune disorders. Again, the autoimmune disorders, the problem is that there are bad clones of T cells, B cells that are attack attacking the recipient cells. One way of potentially treating that is that to replace again the bone marrow and immune cells of the recipient. So uh, I'm just showing this slide to say that back in 68, University of Wisconsin was one of the two places in the world that did the first successful bone marrow transplantation in a patient with Viscot Aldrich, which is an immunodeficiency disorder uh, here in 68 and Again, we just saying that UW contributed really to the field of bone marrow transplantation a lot. So how do we collect uh, the bone marrow? And wh wh what is this organ we are talking about? So this is a patient in the OR laying on his or her stomach. And uh, these are you know, two transplant physicians that using these big needles, we go to the pelvic bones. We give it to a person who is putting it through a bag and filter. And an hour or an hour and a half later, we have this big bag, which is about a liter, sometimes 1,500 ml of the bone marrow, which is like three units of blood. So this is the organ we are transplanting in bone marrow transplantation, essentially looking like blood. This is fat because there is fat inside the bone marrow. And, and we take it to the patient's room and we infuse it. This is the transplant procedure. There is no surgery. I mean, the patient is in the OR, but really there is no surgery. We don't, don't open up the patient. We just go, uh, we go uh, sometimes about 200, 300 times to the pelvic bone because each time we have to collect about three to four ml, not more than that. And I have one scheduled for tomorrow morning. But, but donors do that. Donors all do that. The other way these days is uh, instead of going directly inside the bone marrow, we are giving a medicine to the patient, GCSF and sometimes Mozobil. And by doing that, the, uh, the medicine releases the stem cells, bone marrow stem cells from the bone marrow into the peripheral blood, into the circulation. And then we attach the patient to a machine, a leukophoresis machine. Uh, blood comes out of one arm, it goes into the machine, there is a centrifuge there, it centrifuges the blood, and then there is a, a, a device that collects the stem cells from that layer of uh, blood that has been centrifuged, and then uh, give the, uh, the rest of the blood back to the patient. Uh, 
There's a story behind this slide. So she is 17 years old. Right? So she faked her bone marrow donation card. When she registered, she didn't say that she is 18 years old. And you cannot do donate if you're younger than 18. But then somebody found that she is a donor to somebody. And they were debating, can a less than 18 years old donor donate? And she wanted to donate, and, and she uh, insisted, and she finally donated. So our donors are between 18 and um, 60 years old. They, that's when they are eligible to donate. And again, the major difference is that most of all of our donors are alive and healthy. Uh, they are not deceased donors, except if there is some experimental uh, clinical trial. Um, the siblings under 18, they can donate, but they can only donate to their siblings. So if somebody has a, has a sibling with a cancer, for example, 20 years old, and his or her age is 11, he or she can donate to his, uh, his or her sibling, but not to the others. And, and for some reasons, the way that we collect from siblings from small kids is really uh, the bone marrow harvest. We don't use this technology for small kids. Uh, for, for medical reasons, we don't, we don't use that. So the other way of collecting, uh, uh, probably you have heard this cord blood. Cord blood is a rich source of stem cells. And essentially, it's a waste product. After, after birth, cord blood is, is thrown out. Uh, but uh, there were investigators about 25 years ago, they realized there is a lot of stem cells in, inside the cord blood. So this, there is a procedure, cord blood stem cell collection, and uh, they will be something like this. They put it in the freezer and then they put it. You can donate, you can, you can freeze your, your baby cord blood for your own, I mean for his or her use, or you can donate it to, to the public blood, blood bank. So essentially, converting a waste product to a potential, potential stem cells for transplantation. So the other difference between bone marrow transplantation and cord blood transplantation is that we can freeze the stem cells of the bone marrow and we can keep them at least for 10 years, probably forever. So in contrast in the kidneys that you have to transplant, I don't know, within 72 hours, for bone marrow transplantation we can keep, we can keep uh, the stem cells forever and use it whenever we want. Many times we use them fresh, but uh, we have, you're gonna see uh, the people who are gonna look at the stem cell lab in the hospital, they're gonna see these freezers that we uh, are full of uh, stem cells from different patients and donors. So bone marrow transplant really is a global phenomenon because our donor for a patient may be living in, in Hamburg or somewhere else in Germany or UK or anywhere in the world. So there are about 20 million people who have registered to be donor for bone marrow or peripheral blood stem cell. So when we have a patient that it is in need of transplant, we put the, allo uh, the HLA typing of the patient into a, a computerized system and then they will tell us, for example, there are two donors, one is in Germany, one is in UK, we contact an MDP, they will contact the donor, they will schedule a collection of stem cells or bone marrow in Germany. And then they will put that into a, car uh, a carrier bag and then bring it to, uh, to Madison. And then we transplant this. So it's really, this is a global phenomenon. These are the centers that we are part of the Center for International Bone Marrow Transplant Registry, which is located in, in Milwaukee. So we ship products all over the world. Most of our stem cell donors from overseas are from Germany and UK, and that's because of the background of people uh, in Wisconsin. They were mostly German immigrants, so we get a lot of donors from, from Germany. I, I, I know for solid organ transplantation, they have to be in the country. For us, it's they have to be somewhere on, on this earth. <laughs> so, the concept of bone marrow transplant as the, at the beginning was all based on what we call myeloablative HSC, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or bone marrow transplantation. And I, as I said, uh, there is patient with cancer, we give radiation and some chemotherapy. And at the beginning, uh, before we knew much about the immunology of transplantation, we thought that these modalities are needed to replace, the, to, to kill the cancer cells. So this is a patient with leukemia, these are leukemia cells. The bone marrow is supposed to be like this, but now it's replaced by the leukemia cells. So we give radiation and chemotherapy, which we thought that was going to empty the bone marrow 
and then we go put the cells, the bone marrow cells into this patient, we infuse it IV, but then the cells go inside the bone marrow, and after 14 to 21 days, they replace all the bone marrow cells. So this is the way we thought that bone marrow is transplant is working to treat cancer. And it still is it's one of the way, but it's not the, only, the main reason that the bone marrow transplant is working. Oops, okay. So when we give, sorry, when we give radiation and chemotherapy, one of the side effects is what we call mucositis. People who get high dose radiation uh, after transplant, they develop all these ulcers. They may not be able to eat for a week or two, at least they're gonna be on morphine drips, pain medication. So these are some, some of the toxicities of myeloablative transplant. This is acceptable for cancer patients because without bone marrow transplant, they will die. This is not acceptable for a kidney transplant. You cannot do the same thing to the kidney transplant. Kidney transplant patient, I mean, if doesn't get the kidney, gonna continue on dialysis or, but these are sadly had been acceptable for the cancer patients. The way actually bone marrow transplant and stem cell transplant is working is actually nothing to do with the stem cells. It's all about immune cells of the, uh, of the donor. So when we do transplants, we transplant also a lot of T cells. And the job of the T cells are going after the cancer cells and kill the cancer cells inside the bone marrow. So really, this is not that radiation. Radiation and chemotherapy helps to get rid of some of the cancer cells, but the way it actually works is that the immune cells that we transplant go after those, uh, those leukemia cells and kill them. But sometimes these immune cells get overactivated. These are the donor cells and they go after the tissues of the recipient and that's what we call graft versus host disease. And this is a picture of a patient with graft versus host disease and this is what we want to avoid. Uh, but this could happen because the immune cells of the donor are going after recipient cells, opposite of graft rejection. So one way to decrease the toxicity of transplant and avoid graft versus host disease and also, uh, talk, um, for example, mucositis is, can we use uh, conditioning regimens that are not as toxic? So we used to give a lot of radiation, harsh chemotherapy, but then we realized we can do transplant without giving too much radiation and uh, chemotherapy drugs by just giving some immunosuppressive drugs. We immunosuppress the recipient, so when we are putting the donor cells, the recipient immune cells cannot reject the donor cells. So the donor cells win because they have not seen the, uh, the immunosuppression. So many of these patients, they don't ever get any mucositis. Many of these transplants are done as outpatient because they don't become sick. We give the cells, I mean, we infuse the cells in the clinic, they go home, they never get admitted. But with this type of transplant, so the traditional transplant has been very toxic. We needed intensive chemotherapy and radiation, and still we do that on occasion, but that's for aggressive malignancies non myelablative and sometimes we call it reduced intensity transplant, we give lower dose of chemotherapy radiation, it's much less toxic, and this is something that if we want to use stem cell transplant for, for tolerance induction to an organ, we're not gonna use this regimen, we're gonna use this regimen, Dr. Kaufman gonna talk about that. So just the last few slides, Another major factor in bone marrow transplantation, and that's really the basis of all the work in the last 50 years, to, more than 50 years, to use bone marrow transplantation for induction of tolerance really started with Dr. Owen publication back in 45. Dr. Ray Owen was in genetics department here at UW Medicine. And what he found was that in marrying cattle that are a special type of cattle, they, they have a lot of uh, twin pregnancies. And he found that uh, the, the, the the cattle that, that share a placenta, when they grew, they were carrying two different type of blood groups. They were, had both blood groups that were A and both blood, and O. They were carrying essentially the blood group of the twin cattle. And he showed that, and this was thought that because during the, um, during the intrauterine life, they had a common circulation system allowed the stem cells from bone marrow of one twin to go to the other one, and then keep making blood cells for the rest of the, uh, the lives of the cattle. 
And uh, so they carry blood group of each other, and they carry the bone marrow cells of each other, and because they have immune, se immune system of each other, they tolerate the transplantation from one to the other. So this is really the basis of all the research done in, uh, from 45 moving forward on tolerance induction. And we also, bone marrow transplanters, we use that concept too. So based on Dr. Owen work, we realized that at the beginning when we mix the donor cells with the recipient, for a while the donor and recipient carry both type of cells. And that's the reason I said blood groups of the patient changes after three to six months, because for the first three and six months they are this, both blood groups in, in circulating in the patient. But, for, but after that, it usually converts to the full chimerism. So the donor cells are now all uh, replacing the recipient cells. If we can keep patients in this state, in a state of mixed donor chimerism, again, Dr. Kopp, I'm gonna talk about that. If we can keep patients in this state of mixed chimerism, then each one of them can tolerate organ from the other one. And that's really the goal of tolerance induction using combined bone marrow and kidney transplantation. So you're gonna uh, take a look at uh, our stem cell lab uh, so, uh, because I said that um, the immune cells of the donor can cause graft versus host disease and immunological reactions. We don't need those cells. Uh, what we need is really stem cells, CD34 cells. This is a machine. You're gonna see the machine in our lab. And this is, what we do is that we, we attach magnetic beads to these stem cells, and then there's a big magnet there. So we pass these cells through this big magnet, and then the, uh, uh, the cells that have attached to these magnetic bits are kept inside the magnet, and then we release them, and then we use these purified cells, and this is a way of preventing some of the complications of transplant. So the other thing that you're gonna see, there is a lot of construction right now when you go to see the clinical stem cell lab in the hospital, and that's because we are building a new lab, what, which we call GMP, Good Manufacturing Processing Lab. And that will, will allow us to do many more of these, these promising new type of therapies for induction of tolerance, in, in, including the combined kidney and bone marrow transplant that uh, me and Dr. Coffin and me were planning to do. So just back to the original slide, the differences between bone marrow transplantation and uh, organ transplantation. In organ transplantation, the problem is rejection or host versus graft. In bone marrow transplantation, the problem is graft versus host disease. Uh, in organ transplantation, we don't need cytoablation or myeloablation. In bone marrow, most of the time we need. In organ transplantation, H HLA matching is not essential. In bone marrow transplantation, it is absolutely essential. If instead of 10 out of uh, 10 HLA match, we get nine out of 10 HLA match, then patients do not do well. And the, again, the complication of organ transplant is rejection, ours is GVHD. Uh, it's uncommon to be immunosuppression free after organ transplantation. In bone marrow transplantation, it's very common to come off uh, uh, the immunosuppressive drugs. And in organ transplantation, the goal is for the patient to accept the organ, but really we like to move tolerance from bone marrow transplantation to uh, organ transplantation. So, I'm go Dr. Kauf, I'm gonna be talking about the uh, use of hematopoietic cells for transduction. And this is something that Dr. Kaufman and I have been working for several years, and hopefully we're gonna be able soon to bring it to patients at UW-Madison. Well, that was a fantastic uh, review, overview, and educational lecture on bone marrow transplantation. And this is going to play a larger and larger role in the future in trying to achieve complete immunosuppression withdrawal in our transplant patients. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about where that field is because we're starting to see some very promising early results in a few centers that are going to be adopted um, in other centers, uh, including our own in the future. Um, definitions are important so that we understand what we're all talking about. And tolerance um, has different meanings to different people, but in the organ transplant world, 
we're talking about a situation in which the recipient acquires immunological tolerance. And there's a, a very nice definition of this in uh, a very um, excellent book on the history of transplant immunology written by Leslie Brent, who was an author on one of the very first uh, papers showing that uh, acquired immunological tolerance can be achieved in small animals, uh, which is now what we're trying to do in our um, patients. And he states that it's um, specific unresponsiveness to donor immunogens that can be established by the introduction, the introduction of allogeneic cells into immunologically disparate hosts. That means peripheral mobilized hemopoietic stem cells or bone marrow from one person into another. Now, there are such things as spontaneous tolerance, which occurs when a patient on their own, against medical advice, weans off their own anti-rejection medicines. This may seem shocking, but it actually does happen. Um, and it happens because individuals are doing well sometimes and they feel probably that organ and themselves are getting along so well they really don't need as many medications as the doctor prescribes or suggests. They may have missed a few doses, nothing happened, and before you know it, um, they're off their medicines. And in rare situations, individuals do very well they have a spontaneous acceptance of their organ. And this has been studied in several collected cases to try to understand what's going on. But virtually every time it fails, there are always exceptions. So we always tell individuals that their body has a memory and the medicines are required for life. Now, there are tolerance induction protocols which are purposeful to allow the gradual withdrawal of the anti-rejection medicines from the recipient when they achieve a state of chimerism from bone marrow or hemopoietic stem cells from their donor. And it's purposeful because it requires pre-transplant conditioning and it requires post-transplant conditioning and careful immune suppression withdrawal. Now, the historical context Dr. Hamadi briefly described, starting with Ray Owen's discovery, 1945. And there have been sort of three roads traveled in this that I want to describe to you. In the one road, there is what's called transient chimerism that's associated with the combination of bone marrow and the kidney, that the chimeric state only lasts for a short period of time, disappears, yet patients can withdraw immunosuppression. There's the complete opposite situation in which the patient receives the mobilized peripheral hemopoietic stem cell with what's called a facilitator cell after their conditioning, and the recipient becomes fully chimeric. That means their entire immune system is replaced from the donor cells, and that's in this group here. And then there's the middle road in which stable mixed chimerism or a combination of both donor and recipient immunity exists in the same patient uh, for a long period of time. So let's go through these three examples. It's not clear at this point in time which of these three approaches will be safest and most efficacious. They're all in clinical trials. The first one started in Boston at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And these were studies done uh, about 10 years ago in a very small number of patients, all received, received living-related donor kidney transplants. 
and they all received transient chimerism. Years later, at, in Palo Alto at Stanford University, a different approach was done in which living, living related uh, donors, first they were HLA matched, and now they're one haplotype mismatches, so the, so the HLA matching is fairly common, are transplanted. Then, after the kidney is put in, then the post-transplant conditioning is done to prepare the patient for the bone marrow, and then the bone marrow, which has been stored from the same recipient, from the same donor to that recipient, is then infused into the patient, and they achieve stable mixed chimerism prior to immunosuppression withdrawal. And then um, I mentioned earlier the situation, they're doing this in Chicago at Northwestern where they try to achieve total chimerism. They're using living unrelated and living related, more disparate donor recipient pairs, a pre-transplant conditioning regimen prior to the kidney going in and achieving total chimerism. So those are sort of the three models. Now the hurdles in all three are very similar. The patients must undergo a conditioning regimen, and they're slightly different in each one. They're all non-myoablative, that's important, but they're slightly different. In every patient, we wish to avoid the occurrence of graft versus host disease. That's too aggressive an outcome with the bone marrow transplant. But you also want the bone marrow to engraft so that it, the recipient achieves a state of chimerism. And the degree of donor recipient matching can be variable depending on the particular protocol. Importantly, we want this to be safe. So here's the first report that came out of uh, Boston that talked about HLA mismatched kidney transplantation without maintenance immunosuppression. And this was reported 2008. And this was what their protocol looked like. Once the patients were conditioned and received the bone marrow, then they received their kidney transplant. And they all stay on some immunosuppression for a variable period of time. You can't do this without any immunosuppression. And they're the common agents that you would expect, either cyclosporin or tacrolimus, prednisone, mycophenolate. They showed an example of five of their patients. This is patient five. So you can see after about, um, oh, about nine months, the tacrolimus is eliminated. The other medicines are eliminated a little earlier. And they measure, you can draw blood samples and you can try to detect, quantify how much chimerism is in the recipient from the donor cells. And they noticed that they achieved chimerism for a short period of time and then it went away. There was no graft versus host disease. There were no rejection episodes. The kidney was working very well. And so they went ahead and they started to eliminate the anti-rejection medicine and got, um, got the patients off. Besides monitoring the creatinine values to show that the kidney's working well, they do kidney biopsies to make sure that within the organ there's not malignant you know, uh, rejection um, detrimental infiltrates. And this is an example of a, of a good, good histologic picture of that. In the uh, second example at uh, Northwestern in Chicago, they reported uh, their results about uh, three years ago and talked about um, chimerism intolerance in HLA mismatched uh, transplants. So these are in patients that do not share many uh, HLA antigens. So these are a little bit more difficult uh, to achieve. Their conditioning regimen is a little stronger. It's still non-myoablative, uh, but it's not completely benign. They get some strong medications, fludarabine, um, total body lymphoid irradiation, some cytoxan. And you can see how this is done 
up front. And you saw from Dr. Hamadi how the bone marrow changes with some of these conditioning agents. It sort of um, uh, diminishes or creates space for the, for the new uh, bone marrow. And so the patient then receives their transplant and then the next day they receive an infusion of the prior co co uh, collected uh, hemopoietic stem cells with some T cells and in this uh, particular protocol a special cell type called a facilitator cell that helps protect um, the patient from rejecting either the bone marrow so they get engraftment and protects against GVHD. After the transplant is performed and the conditioning, uh, they are maintained on tacrolimus and MMF. Uh, over a period of time, the MMF is weaned off after six months. And then if everything is going well, meaning the kidney is working, there's no rejection, there's no GVHD, then the tacrolimus is slowly weaned off uh, by 12 months, and then they're off medications completely. In their first series of report of about uh, 16 patients, uh, they had very good success uh, of about 75% of the patients were successfully weaned off the medicine. And uh, the histologic examination of the transplants looked really clean, really good. So this is um, a very, very promising uh, technology that they have now extended uh, to many more patients. And to compare the, the Boston and the Chicago group, the main difference is full chimerism in the Chicago group, mixed transient chimerism in the Boston group, and you can see kind of the comparative conditioning. Cytoxin used here for, in Boston, they use a induction agent called anti-CD2 antibody, whereas in uh, Chicago, I think they were using alemtuzumab, and then the standard immunosuppression weaned off. The Stanford protocol is um, a little bit of a different paradigm. It's very similar, um, but in this case, the kidney is actually transplanted first, and then the patient's conditioned and given uh, the bone marrow. And the reason why that's interesting is because this is a protocol, although currently applied in living donor repairs, could be applied in the future for deceased donors because the patient is, receives their transplant first, then they get their conditioning and the, the, the donor marrow and cells don't go in till much later. So in a deceased donor situation, it would be possible to collect all these cells at the time of organ donation, process them, put them aside, do the kidney transplant just like usual, start with the anti-rejection medicines, very similar to what you've been hearing about earlier today, tacrolimus, MMF, steroids, antithymocyte globulin, but then in addition their conditioning includes total lymphoid irradiation over a period of two weeks, and then the collected donor hemopoietic stem cells, these are CD34 cells, and some T cells are infused, and then the monitoring process begins. Is the kidney working well, monitoring creatinine, any sign of rejection down the line or GVHD. If not, then start weaning off the immunosuppression and as long as everything is going well, continue to monitor the patient. In this situation, a low level of chimerism of about 10% or more, which we call stable mixed, continues throughout this period of time and that's sort of the biomarker or the safety figure that says it's safe to continue to wean off the medication. Because you don't want to wean it off and then have the patient reject and lose their kidney. So everything is done in stepwise fashion. So to kind of um, 
finish up, you know, how, how have these worked out thus far? They're all done in relatively low numbers. They're uh, in very, um, they're in rigorous clinical trials. They get funding from NIH and, and other sources to do this. And they're all done right now at just a single center until they kind of work it out. They can define the efficacy and the safety. So at the MGH, they've done a total of 10 patients. Uh, seven have been immunosuppression free at five years. Three resumed immunosuppression um, at seven, eight, and 10 years. And so it doesn't work 100% of the time, but for many, many years, they're immunosuppression free. Eliminating these medications has definite health benefits, less diabetes, less hypertension. So patients are healthier. The Stanford group has thus far enrolled 31 patients. In the, the fully matched donor-recipient combination, these are typically siblings in which all their antigens match, 75% um, develop stable mixed chimerism and could be completely withdrawn from immunosuppression. And the organs work, they don't get GVHD, uh, and they've done uh, really, really well. This is a very promising and a very safe uh, procedure thus far. The group is now looking at more disparate donor-recipient pairs with one haplo mismatches, defining how many cells are required from the donor to the recipient to achieve stable mixed chimerism, but there's a lot of interest uh, in this particular protocol. And then the Northwestern protocol um, has reported also uh, 31 individuals, uh, some as long as five years. And this differs from the other two groups because the patients are more genetically disparate, if you will, living unrelated. Um, 20 have been studied that have had long-term follow-up, and 16 of those 20 have been uh, successfully withdrawn from immunosuppression. What's also particularly interesting in this group is because all the patients, when they're monitored, have full chimerism, they are not developing graft-versus-host disease despite the fact that they've got somebody else's immune system in them and they're off all immunosuppression. And so there's a lot of interest as to why that is uh, happening, what the role of facilitator cell is, um, and this kind of approach does um, allow a greater disparity and would create more access for a transplant in this situation. So to conclude, these three avenues are all very promising. Um, they're, however, only been done at single centers and need to be done at more centers to see if it's repeated. More numbers have to be done to ensure its safety. Uh, Novartis is one of the important pharmas, very interested in the field of transplantation. They are in the process of developing a multi-center phase three trial that will mimic the Northwestern uh, protocol with the facilitator cell. And that, I think, is going to be the first sort of breakout large uh, study in this that you may become more aware of, uh, and it will probably start uh, in about nine months or so. Um, and um, at the uh, MGH, now they've also got um, collaborations at Columbia University. They're renewing their studies. They've done 10 patients. They're renewing their studies with the anti-CD2 antibody um, and the transient chimerism to um, increase uh, their uh, numbers to understand more fully about it. So that is where the uh, state of the field is currently and which centers have started promising protocols and how this uh, might escalate and be increased to more and more centers so more and more patients can benefit. We understand this promising area in a great, in much more detail.
So I would like to um, stop at this point. If uh, we've got a few minutes to answer your questions, Dr. Hamadi and myself are available on the podium now and will be available um, during the tours uh, as well. So thank you. I have a question. So yes. BMT transplanters have said for a long time that two immune systems don't play well together in the same body, that one ultimately dominates. What is it that allows the mixed chimerism mm -hmm. to remain stable? Well, it's, it's felt that the, the conditioning regimen and total uh, lymphoid irradiation alters the recipient immune system to allow enough engraftment of the cells, but not over engraftment, and achieves a certain balance. The amount of chimerism one achieves is also dependent on how many cells go into the recipient. So when the cells are collected from the donor, they can be quantified and measured so you get sort of just the right amount. It's possible to always overdo something or underdo something, and by repetition, uh, they've understood sort of what the right window is. So those are the two things that seem to make the most difference. Microphone's on the way. Um, so with, you know, in a kidney transplant, although the risk is very low, say someone's 10 years out, they may still have a, you know, they have that risk of rejection. If you are in this stable state of mixed chimerism, is the graft versus host disease risk something after that first six months, or is that more of just an immediate risk? Well, that, that's a very good question that nobody completely has the answer to yet. You know, will GVHD kind of rear its head, you know, later down the road, and thus far um, it has been um, almost a non-occurrence in the Boston series where they have transient chimerism, which isn't surprising because it goes away, nor in the Stanford group where they have very low levels of stable mixed. In the Northwestern um, experience where they have full chimerism, this is where there's a little bit more concern as to kind of what's holding it back from sort of exploding. But some of the patients have been followed for uh, three, four years and have not shown either um, acute or a chronic um, form of GVHD. Uh, it's not quite clear if we understand why that is. Um, it's still a relatively small number of patients, and it's still of concern and looms out there. Now, there are treatments for that if it crops up. Certainly, patients are being monitored, um, but has yet uh, not been uh, a concern. Now, when um, the new study starts, and there will be multiple centers involved and many more patients, I think we'll learn more about the risk. And as I showed in one of the slides, the hurdles we have, the most important thing is safety, 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 because transplantation is, you know, fairly safe the way we're doing it now. We don't want to make it less safe, but we want to achieve some of the breakthroughs that might minimize or completely eliminate the medications because there's some real health benefits uh, to doing that. Dr. Hamadi, do you have some comments as to what might be holding people in check and not getting GVHD? So this is what we also sometimes see in uh, patients who had sickle cell disease. For sickle cell disease, we don't need really to replace the whole bone marrow because if we have just half of the bone marrow making good red blood cells, the hemoglobin of the patient will be to a level that is safe. And as Dr. Kaufman said, as, as of now, I can't remember seeing any report that GVHD happens years later if mixed chimerism state stays, there's always the risk that mixed chimerism goes away and become all, all uh, recipients. So usually it happens and it stays as recipients rather than the donor cells when they are mixed chimerism for a long time. Usually 
uh, the donors don't take over to call GBP. And then I have another question. Is this anything that you would see in the future that we could use with um, deceased donors? So um, there's a big potential for that, but it would probably have to resemble what the Stanford group is doing um, because the conditioning is done after the transplant, which would, of course, be the situation for deceased donors. Now, there's going to be other uh, mechanisms or other techniques to try to also induce uh, tolerance through the infusion into the recipient of a special line of regulatory T cells that are grown up um, that is not a formal hemopoietic stem cell or bone marrow transplant that some programs are starting to investigate, though there haven't been any reports in clinical trials yet. So that's another possible avenue that would be more appropriate and more um, linked to a deceased donor um, situation. So you may hear about those kinds of things um, in the future as well. So uh, people had done some clinical trials using the deceased donor bone marrow, but none of them led to any good mixed chimerism. So they collected the bone marrow from vertebral body of the deceased donor and infused it, but they never showed that there was mixed chimerism because the recipient always rejected those cells. But in the future, we like to see safe methodologies that allow to do this in the, in the deceased donor. Do we have any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Hansen. Thank you.